Hello, and welcome to Windows and Time. We have Peter Finkel here today with us, and he's going to be talking about Ashland's cultural journey, 1850 pioneers to the Oregon Shakespearean Festival. So Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the judicial lands of the Cow Creek Band of Unqua Tribe of Indians and the Modoc Nation, as well as the Shasta, Taklama, and Lakwa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederate tribes of Silas Indians and the Confederate tribes of Crown Ron. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous people whose traditional lands are where residents of Jackson County live today. JCLS is committed to fostering understanding, deep respect, and honor for indigenous people, and we encourage you to learn more about the land you reside on. For more information, go to jcls.org.land. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Southern Oregon Historical Society, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this uh, co-sponsored event. Today's talk is by Peter Finkel, whose life is as interesting and varied as the topics he presents. Peter was raised in a variety of settings, Northern Italy, Austria, Southern California. He spent much of his professional life in the health uh, industry, uh, providing uh, nutritious supplements, uh, health products to people in which he uh, handled marketing and uh, promotion. Um, he has been in Ashland uh, for some 30 years now, and has, from the beginning in 1991, when he arrived, has been deep diving the neighborhoods to better understand the people, the places, and most important of all, the ideas that make Ashland so very special. Today's talk, Ashland's culture from the 1850s, Oregon, um, to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival illustrates that. Peter? Thank you, Larry. And I am so glad. Wow, this is a great turnout. I'm, I'm so happy to be here and also to the people who are watching online. Um, and first, I want to thank the library and the Southern Oregon Historical Society for this series of, of monthly talks. Um, this is the third one I have given, and uh, you know each one has been interesting. So I'm going to try to leave because I know this is a uh, an interested and knowledgeable audience. I'm going to try to leave like ten or fifteen minutes at the end for questions and dialogue. Um, so I want to begin. Okay, first, how many people have seen this photo? before? How many in the audience? A few, okay, a, about a quarter maybe. Um, I'm going to be talking about it in a in a moment. I'm going to start with two or two stories that I think capture some of the emotional impact of the topic, which is how we how Ashland grew from a community of pioneers, tiny community of pioneers in the 1850s to a community that was able to birth and support and help to grow the Oregon Shakespeare Festival to what it is today. So this first story is from June 1893. It was told by Homer Billings. I got it from a booklet that he wrote. Um, and it is about the Chautauqua movement. C-H-A-U-T-A-U-Q-U-A, -A -A, Chautauqua. The Chautauqua movement developed 10-day summer programs with educational speakers, moral teaching, and entertainment it started in Chautauqua Lake, New York, but spread to rural areas throughout the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, here in Southern Oregon, a group of Southern Oregon community leaders began meeting in the fall of 1892 to try to get something, uh, one of these 10-day Chautauqua programs going, and they were sort of leaning towards uh, Central Point. There was a nice park in Central Point that, that, that they were leaning towards. But in their meeting of June 14, 1893, 
G.F. Billings, who was Homer's father, the father of the fellow who told this story, he talked this group of community leaders into choosing Ashland for the site of the 10-day Chautauqua summer programs. And so the, but the date that had already been picked was July the 5th, the day after the 4th of July. So put that together. The meeting was June 14th. The date to start was July the 5th. It's not very long, right? So how, how, what did they need to do? Well, first they needed to raise some money. Second, they needed some land to build a building on. Third, they needed to build the building. And fourth, they needed to plan the program. 21 days. Well, the, the whole Ashland community rallied around this, um, this dream, this ideal of, of uh, you know, bringing a nat this national program here to Southern Oregon and specifically in Ashland. Money was raised. Check number one. An eight acre plot of land happened to be available right next to the Ashland Plaza. It was purchased. Check off number two. Okay, now there were 10 days left. Well, there were about um, 40 work, as many as 40 workers at a time pitched in over these next 10 days to build this building. Uh, 80 feet in diameter and 40 feet high, a wooden wooden domed structure. They called it a beehive shaped dome. And when was it completed? It was completed on July, the afternoon of July the 4th, the day before the Ch first Chautauqua program started. So that's that's my first story kind of about that community enthusiasm and, and effort that went into making this possible. Okay, my second story is from, goes fast forward a bit to 1947. So the Oregon Shakespeare Festival started in 1935 with a very simple primitive theater. This is the 1947 stage that was it was um, slightly it's still still primitive as you'll see in a moment, but it was um, it was slightly slightly better. Um, so this story is from the time when it was being created, and again a community related story. This is a story was told by the founder of Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Angus Bomer. So I'm quoting him now. Members of the community, especially the college community, became enthusiastic participants in readying this theater for occupancy. Something of the nature of the community spirit that pervaded the preparations for the season are illustrated by a story told by Marshall Waddell. One night during a rehearsal, Marshall was busy at some task now long forgotten, which required him to be up on a ladder in the amphitheater. Well, he felt a tug on his trouser cuff and a man he did not know spoke up to him. This man said, hey, what organization do you belong to? And Marshall said, what? And the, the man said, are you getting overtime for this? Oh, said Marshall, you mean do I belong to a union? No, no, I am the dean of men out at the college the college that is now Southern Oregon University. You see that ma man working on the spotlight over there? That's Professor Elliot McCracken. He's the head of the science department. That man with the hammer is Otto Wilda of our art department. The young man digging that hole is Edmund Dews. He's a Rhodes Scholar. And the man studying his lines over there is Elmo Stevenson, just the president of the college. Oh, said this, this man who had been, who had tugged on his trousers. Uh, he, oh, said this man rubbing his chin. I didn't know it was anything like that. Hey, have you got your plumbing in yet? Marshall said, no, I don't believe we had. And the man said, say, my name is John Mills. I'm a plumber. If you get someone to donate the fixtures, I'll put your plumbing in for you. 
I've read that story a bunch of times, but it's, it still gets to me. Um, so these are just two, two little snippets to, to try to express the uh, one, one way of looking at how the Ashland community has been actively involved ever since the 1800s in, you know, in helping things uh move forward and and new new creative endeavors to to be able to take place um so now i'm going to get to some facts and some history and i'm going to try to weave in some of the cultural themes that together have led to the the community that uh, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival specifically, and and the cultural richness of the entire Rogue Valley as well as the town of Ashland today, and these themes include education, music, theater, uh, tourism orientation, uh, and, and also parks and the appreciation of nature. Um, so let's take a start before the themes i want to kind of set some dates for you uh the first date is 1852 which was the january 1852 the town of ashland was founded um and uh that same year a lumber mill was built along ashland creek using the water from the creek to to power the uh the saw um, two years later, a flour mill was erected, and it was also along Ashland Creek, uh, with the uh, the mill the the millstones being powered by the by the water. Um, the flour mill was located what at what is now the entrance to Lithia Park. This is the earliest photo I have been able to find of. Ashland. This is about 1860, and this was the original flour mill that was that was built there. And then here's what it here's what the flour mill looked like in 1895. And uh, I love this photo because the Ashland Plaza had been created by 1895. I'm going to tell you about that a little bit later. You can see there's some buildings uh, on the far right edge of the photo. There are some buildings, and and you can see the farmers bringing their grain uh, into town to have it uh, milled into flour here. So, um, Carrie, uh, as, as is done at, at many community events, Carrie uh, read the land acknowledgement for the. Uh, the native people who had lived here before the founding of Ashland in 1852. And I will also mention that I, we want to remember that, you know, Ashland is what, 170 something years old now, but the people who, the Shasta and the Tekelma people who were actually living right where that photo is, there was a winter, a Shasta Indian winter village right right there around where Ashland Plaza and Lithia Park are, right where that photo was taken. Um, they had been living in the area, according to the archeological evidence, for probably about 10,000 years. That's a lot of generations. <laughs> um, so, okay, let's get into our um, cultural themes. I want to start with the value of education and all the way back to the 1850s. Um, here is the first teacher in the Ashland, uh, Ashland Elementary School. So uh, does anybody know that school districts have numbers you see on the school buses? Well, Ashland School District is the, the buses say Ashland School District number five. Well, Ashland School District number five was founded in 1857. So this is Lizzie, Lizzie, she was Lizzie Anderson in 1857, later Lizzie Anderson McCall. Um, and I want to quote from a speech that she gave later in her life about the founding of uh, um, Ash, the Ashland School District number five. And uh, the background for, for 
this excerpt from her speech is that maybe a, a year or so before, a year or two before, she had saved the life of one of Ashland's founders, the life of the infant child of one of Ashland's founders. The infant child was John Hellman. Okay, she had saved his life. And that's a whole other story, which I don't have time to tell you. So um, so I'm quoting, quoting her speech now. Now, little John Hellman, bless his heart, he repaid me in a very interesting way. Several families wanted a school to be taught right in Ashland, and I was to be the first teacher. Mr. Clark was teaching school to the east a short way, but I would be the first teacher right in Ashland if 13 students could be found. So the state, um, Ashland wasn't even, a, I mean, Oregon wasn't even a state in 1857. That came two years later. But there was an Oregon Territory legislature, and the regulation was you had to have 13 students to start a school district. So they had 12, 12 students that they were able to find. Um, well, there were only 12 until little John, only three years old, was recruited to be the 13th. Class was held in the Eber Emery home, and I boarded with the Hellmans. It must have been difficult for such a little child to sit quietly on a rough plank seat for long hours, with nothing to do but draw pictures of questionable clarity and watch the other students. But that is how Ashland School District Number 5 had its beginning. Um, and just a, a side note about uh, Lizzie, who was uh, a very dynamic uh, woman, both as a young woman and also later in life. She married uh, Captain John McCall in, so today's July the 3rd. She, they, the two of them got married on July the 4th, 1876. Is that a patriotic day or what? So uh, July, and then in 1883, they built the McCall House, which is a, a beautiful house that you can still see. It's a bed and breakfast now, but it's on Oak Street in Ashland. Um, okay. Now I'm going to get back to education, the education theme a, a little bit later, but I want to go back to the um, uh, the plaza. Um, so John Hellman, who was, I mean, Abel Hellman, who was one of the co-founders of Ashland in January of 1852, he was the dad of the little John who made the school district possible. Um, he was involved in building the flour mill, and he and his wife, uh, Martha, owned 320 acres, the, the land, all the land right around the fire, flour mill, as well as a lot of land to the, to the north and, and to the west. Um, so he made a, a, a decision in 1855 that really kind of created, ultimately, the town of Ashland that we have today. So the flour, he had the flour mill, but it was, it was more like this. It was just in the middle of a field. And he decided to uh, create a, a community area with 12 commercial lots around the community area. So the com the community area he donated to the to the town, and it was called the Ashland Plaza. What is it called now in 2024? The Ashland Plaza, right? Um, and the um, and because he did this, I mean, the, because the the North South Road which had originally been a Native American trail and then became a wagon train trail, and then it became a stagecoach road, then it became Highway 99, for those of you who might remember before the interstate was here. Um, and that, that road went right through, at, you know, right in front of the mill, but by creating this commercial center, the whole town started to grow around it people built built homes around it and here we are here we are today um 
The, the buildings were originally made of, of wood. These are the buildings in eight, about 1875 on the west side of the plaza. Um, sadly, there was a disastrous fire on March 11, 1879, that started in the um, blacksmith shop, which was on the corner. You might, uh, whoa, you might uh, might be able to see, I don't know if you can even see it, on the right-hand edge of the photo, there's a sign in front of that building that says blacksmithing and wagon making. So 1875, that was a wood building, blacksmith shop, a fire started there. It took out all the all the buildings along that side of the plaza. So the business people made a commitment to rebuild in brick. And this is a 1909 photo. Um, on the right is the Masonic Lodge, which was rebuilt in brick in 1879 by the end of the year. And then five years later, the building on the left was the first bank in Ashland, the Bank of Ashland building. Um, here's another building that was um, rebuilt in 1879. Uh, this photo I took, the IOOF building, International Order of Odd Fellows. And right on the top is the date, 1879. Um, so... So the so now there was the center of town that the city of town of Ashland was still small but it was started to build around that plaza and then the um oh so here's here's the photo today of the masonic building on the right from 1879 and the uh bank of ashland building on the left from 1884 now those of you who are are sharp or architecturally savvy might be looking at that and saying, wait a minute, the Masonic building looks different. It was two stories in 1909. It's three stories now. That's because I guess the Masons were thriving in the early, early 1900s and they added a third story in 1929. But it, it's the, the same basic building. Um, so the the other uh, the other theme that is really important in terms of how Ashland uh, grew to the town that it is today was the coming of the railroad. And this 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 is an unusual photo. You, it's, this is the railroad depot uh, in about 1915. There must have been something very special going on that day, but. There were four or five trains a day that came through Ashland, uh, Southern Pacific trains that came through Ashland for decades. Um, but I'm going to take you back to uh, December the 17th, 1887, when Southern Pacific completed building the railroad tracks over the Siskiyou Mountain Range. Even today, driving those mountains is, you know, it's a haul. Uh, all the way from here to Reading. And, um, um, but before that was, that, the railroad tracks were built, how did you get to Southern Oregon? Maybe you were able to ride in a stagecoach. You know, you that was better than walking. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, it was a chore and the railroad changed everything. It was sudden, then it became, you know, comfortable and, and uh, quick, comparatively quick. So it was a big deal. And there was a golden spike ceremony in Ashland on December 17th, 1887 to honor completing the tracks. Charles Crocker, the vice president of Southern Pacific was here. Just to give you an idea how big of a deal it was, the governor of Oregon and the governor of California were both here. The mayors of a bunch of the cities along the West Coast were in Ashland. Um, and as Charles Crocker was hammering in the golden spike with a silver hammer, 
bells were ringing simultaneously in San Francisco, Sacramento, Portland, and other West Coast cities. So, um, and that led to the creation of what's called the Railroad District in Ashland, uh, uh, that whole part of town. And the whole town of Ashland basically took off 1888 and, and through the early 1900s. Um, people actually took the train to come shopping from, you know, Grants Pass, Medford, Wairica, um, Redding, uh, both Southern Oregon and Northern California towns. Um, they came to Ashland for shopping, for mineral waters, for the Chautauqua programs. I'm going to tell you more about for the July 4th parades. It's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, the for parks and nature, for theater, music. Um, and so let's get to music as another theme. How many of you have been to an Ashland City Band concert? Oh, that's great. Congre I, I go to almost everyone, my wife and I. We love their, the Thursday night programs have started up again. So uh, this usually mid-June through mid-August. Uh, every Thursday night, except tomorrow night, they're going to play after the parade at noon in Lithia Park at the band shell. But the Ashland City Band goes all the way back to 1876. OK, uh, this is an early version. It was originally called the Ashland Brass Band. And you can see they fit on somehow they fit on top of a, a stagecoach uh, that might have been in a parade. I'm not sure where that photo was taken. Um, and the city band was actually written into the Ashland City Charter in 1938. So it is community funded, which is very rare for um, for city bands. Um, the uh, in 1916, when Lithia Park was built, was dedicated, uh, there was a, a, a band stand. So the band is playing up, up on the second level on the band stand. And you can see uh, a large crowd gathered in Lithia Park. And here is a couple of weeks ago. The band stand has been replaced. It was replaced in 1949 by the Butler band shell, but it's in the exact same spot. And the usually there's 200 to 500 people gathered on Thursday evenings for the, the city band concert. Um, I, I just want to mention something fun about, um, I don't, I don't, uh, there's facts and then there's people. So I want to uh, honor some people. Um, this in this photo, Christine Lundahl is the conductor, um, but uh, she's the current conductor, the first female conductor in the history of the band going back to 1876. So kudos to to her and to the board for choosing her for that. Um, and then before. Christine took over, uh, Don Beagler was the conductor of the city band for 25 years. And he also, between the years he was conductor and also as a, a member of the band, he's been with the band for 56 years in all. Well, okay, you're saying that's incredible, but wait till you hear this. Mm -hmm. So the con conductor before Don was Rail Maddox. I don't know if any of you knew, knew Rail. Um, he was the conductor for 22 years, but if you include all the years, he was also a player in the band. He was with the city band for an astounding 71 years from 1947 as a kid to 2018. Um, and sadly he, he passed away, but, um, um, so I just want to, um, uh, mention, I'm in the, at the very end, I'll, I'll show you the my website address. But I want to mention that if you if you if you are uh, let's put it this way, if if this has piqued your interest to learn more about the Ashland City Band, I wrote four photo essays 
on my website, walkashland.com, about the history of, of the city band. So there's lots, lots and lots there. Um, okay, so I started out the program with the 1890, that photo of the 1893 Chautauqua building dome. So let's get back to Chautauqua because it is really a crucial element in the development of the the culture of Ashland uh, and and Southern or the Rogue Valley as a whole. Um, I began my talk with home that story from Homer Billings, and he was eight years old in 1893. Um, but uh, because he was involved, he kind of grew up with it. So because uh, his dad, G.F. Billings, um, was, uh, I think he helped run it for about 20 years. So that Homer's entire childhood. Um, and I here's another quote from him that I think really illustrates uh, how the different, you know, I'm talking about the different themes music, uh, education, um, mineral waters, tourism orientation, how they kind of interact uh, and reinforce each other. So here's uh, quoting, quoting Homer again. Sometimes history seems to run in cycles. If there, hadn't, if there had not been talk of a college in Ashland in 1893, Chautauqua probably would not have come to Ashland and might not have even gained a footing in Southern Oregon. If the college had not been on its way to a splendid rebirth about the time that Chautauqua faded out, we might not have a Shakespeare festival today. So here's here. this is kind of fun. This is the inside of that uh, 1893 Chautauqua building and you can see there's a uh, a big full house and and people up on the stage in uh, in the front. Um, so Chautauqua pro, you know, as I mentioned, they were ten day summer educational programs, but they also had a lot of moral teachings. The Women's Christian Temperance Union um, uh, preachers, um, and, and, and also a lot of entertainment to try to bring the people in. Um, so it was so popular um, that they had to, they decided to expand, it sold out every year. So in 1905, they expanded it. Now, somehow what they did was cut cut this building in half and stretch it. <laughs> you see that? And it's a lot larger. Um, and so they could accommodate more people. Um, you know, what, okay, you have to remember something, 1893, 1905, did, we, did they have the internet to, uh, did they have televisions to turn on? Did they have radio to turn on? No, none of that. None of that. So it was a big deal to have nationally known people come into this small town or, you know, or to come into Southern Oregon, which was really a lot more isolated than it is today. Um, so I want to just give you a, a, a brief out, uh, list of a few of the people and entertainers who came during these years of Chautauqua, the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, Joaquin Miller was a famous poet uh, and writer about the Old West in those years. Uh, Miss Jessie Ackerman spoke about her travels to Iceland. So most of the people who lived here in Southern Oregon they probably hardly made it out of Southern Oregon, let alone to you know some other country. So this was this was exciting to have someone, and there were many many speakers uh, uh, about travels to other countries. Miss Ida Benfi did readings from A Tale of Two Cities and Les Miserables. 
There were politicians who came. Henry Bucktell, the governor of Colorado from 1907 to 1909. Uh, J.P. Dolliver, who was a senator from Iowa from 1900 to 1910. Um, and then um, sort of celebrities, Billy Sunday, who had been a famous baseball player, but he became America's leading evangelist of, of his time. And then a very different famous person, Booker T. Washington, who was a black educator and uh, the founder of Tuskegee University. Then there was a lot of music and, and other entertainment along those lines. Um, just again, just a few selected examples. A quartet of male jazz singers called the Knickerbocker Quartet. Um, a chamber music group from San Francisco called the Passmores. They was piano, cello, and violin. They were so popular, they were brought back three times. And then there were big bands that did the sort of the Chautauqua circuit, and including the Southern Oregon Chautauqua. The Innis Band in 1909, Chiri Chillo's Italian Band in 1915, the New York City Marine Band in 1916, and the John Philip Sousa Band. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with that name. Um, he was right here in Southern Oregon playing live. We get, when the city band plays, they always play some of his songs on the 4th of July. But um, so, the 1905 building kept selling out too, these 10 day. So what did they do? They built a bigger one. 1917, and they were kind of gutsy because they actually took out a, a good sized loan for the time to build this building. So this time, instead of just having the the wood, the wooden roof kind of go all the way to the ground, the way those first two buildings did, this this was built on a uh, thick and tall concrete foundation with again a, a big wooden dome over the top of it. Well. For a variety of reasons, the enthusiasm for Chautauqua programs declined around the country and especially in Southern Oregon in the early to mid 1920s. And so the Chautauqua, I, I haven't been able to find the exact year that it closed, um, but the Chautauqua closed sometime in around the mid, mid 1920s. Um, so, I'm going to come back to it because there's a tie, a very strong tie in with Oregon Shakespeare Festival that I'm sure some of you already know about, but don't tell anybody else. Okay. Um, let's talk about the, the parks, uh, Ashland's park system, especially Lithia Park has been a draw for people to come to Ashland for more than 100 years. Um, the original, remember I mentioned 1893, they bought eight acres around that building. So there was a small park that the women of the community actually uh, voluntarily took care of um, for a number of years. And then um, the women of the community that Ashland flour mill was not doing very well by the early 1900s. You know, it had been there since 1854, but there it was really primitive compared to all, there were much more modern, larger flour mills by that time, you know, around other parts of Southern Oregon. So it was an eyesore and it was right next, it was right in the middle of town next to the plaza. So the women of the community, um, lobbied uh, for a measure to go on the ballot, and it did go on the ballot in, in 1909, I mean in 1908, um, and the people of Ashland voted to tear down the flour mill and dedicate the land that land and some additional land nearby towards the expansion of the park, which 
that original Chautauqua Park expanding that. So this uh, is the what's now the Lower Duck Pond in Lithia Park, and that was built in 1910. Um, this was the uh, what Lithia Park looked like on a busy summer day in the 1920s. Um, and on the right is the bandstand. On the left is one of the mineral water uh, tasting gazebos. And so let me talk about the mineral waters a little bit, because again, this is part of the, it, it's actually a track, there were a number of uh, mineral water spas throughout Southern Oregon, where, where there were both hot and cold water mineral springs, but even right in the town of Ashland, there were several mineral springs that were developed. The only one that's still here is um, now called Ashland Well Springs, uh, you know, right on the north, north end of town. Um, but um, there, the business people thought that Ashland could become a huge spa community like Saratoga Springs, New York. The, they would want to call it the jewel of the Northwest. And so they had these these vast ideas of big hotels and and uh, you know spas where people would bathe and get healed of every ailment known to known to man or woman. Um, and so they on the this is a photo of the railroad depot in the early 1900s, and this building in the foreground was a lithia water tasting. Uh, gazebo. So they figured, hey, let's grab those train passengers when they come into town and get them to taste our lithia water. Well, if you have tasted the lithia water, um, you may you may know that uh, that was probably not a very good selling point, uh, having people taste it. But um, uh, but when Lithia Park was dedicated, there were um, though, I'm sorry, there were three, three of these mineral water gazebos. And so in 1916 was, was when Lithia Park was dedicated. Three of these mineral water gazebos, one, uh, they had piped in Lithia water. One, they had piped in what they called white sulfur water, mineral water. And the third one was called soda, soda water. Um, and I, I have not been able to find out what the difference was between the three of them, but um, they, they, so there, there was this dream, this, the dream to create a spa community never happened, but the dream to try to draw people to Ashland uh, lived on, of course. Um, and so now let's get to theater, but you know, people associate theater in Ashland with OSF, of course, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. But I was, as I've done research over the last six years uh, into Ashland history, I was surprised to find that Shakespeare plays have been performed, Shakespeare plays, not just theater, but Shakespeare plays have been performed in Ashland at least as far back as 1887. Um, that's a long time ago when that was when the town was what, 62, seven town was 35 years old and it was still a, just a small pioneer community, but, um, they had a Shakespeare, a Shakespeare show there. Um, so I want to tell you about the, the three story Ganyard opera house in downtown Ashland because there were Shakespeare plays performed here uh, uh, four different years between 1903 and 1910. This was built by Oscar and Lucinda Gagnard in 1889. The opera, the opera house theater occupied the top two floors. The ground floor was um, a grocery and in the early years it was called the opera house grocery. <laughs> um, and um, sadly, a fire in 1912 destroyed the, the upper two 
floors, which meant that the theater was destroyed. They were able to save the ground floor. And um, this is what it looks like today. That's at, again at the corner of East Main and Pioneer. Um, what I want to point out to you is the 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 you can still see the original cut sandstone columns on either side of the of the entrance door from the 1890 Opera House building. Um, so the Opera House it, it, it you know hosted lots of local events you know. High the school talent shows and and all kinds of local activities, um, but also touring companies. And one of the touring companies that came here was led by Charles Hanford. This is a uh, touring uh, poster of him as Petruchio, uh, may, uh, lead in the Taming of the Shrew by William Shakespeare. Um, just I'll mention briefly that um, he, as a young actor, he kind of learned learned the, the craft touring in the company led by Edwin Booth, who was probably the most famous Shakespearean actor of the uh, 1800s. Now, does the name Booth ring a bell? Um, Edwin Booth's brother was John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Um, and uh, But Edwin Booth uh, was, a, was not connected with that, as far as we know. Well, Edwin Booth retired in 1891. Charles Hanford took over his company, as far as I could tell. And um, he came to Ashland in 1903 uh, and... Taming of the Shrew, that, that show that he's dressed for there. 1908, he came back and they performed The Merchant of Venice. Uh, 1909, Much Ado About Nothing. And 1910, again, The Taming of the Shrew. And these four shows were all at that Scanyard Opera House. Um, so, am I, am I, are you with me? Okay, I know I'm I'm zipping around a lot, but we um we have a lot of a lot of ground to cover. Um wait a minute. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay. I wow, I apologize. Okay, so um I am I will go through all of the rest of the photos, and I apologize that we're not going to have questions and answers for the uh, people on the on the on the Zoom. Um, this is the so I'll get back to education when the town was just twenty years old. This is the first college that was started in Ashland. It was a teachers' college. Um, and then uh, this was a, a larger teacher's college called a normal school that was founded in 1895 on Siskiyou Boulevard. And there's a street called Normal Avenue. Um, and, and then this is the current, this is the Churchill Hall, the administrative building of our current Southern Oregon University. And it was here that Angus Bomer uh, was hired to be a professor of English in 1931. So, um, okay, so I wanna get back, remember this, these, the roof was torn down in December 1933. So here's what was left when the roof was torn down. And in 1934, Angus Bomer was out walking with a friend and somehow the shape of these concrete walls that had been the foundation of that Chautauqua building reminded him of the shape of Shakespeare's Globe Theater in London. And he determined to 
start doing some Shakespeare plays within this within this structure, outdoor plays. So this is the um, playbill from 1935. He called it the first annual Shakespearean festival. Next year is going to be the 90th anniversary. And Twelfth Night was performed on July 2 and 4, and Merchant of Venice on July the 3rd. This is what the stage looked like in the 1935 uh, production of Twelfth Night. And here is where we are today with the, the Elizabethan theater, looking a lot fancier than that. <laughs> uh, Elizabethan theater is on the left. The Bomer theater is on the right. That is the indoor theater that was built in 1970. And it was really the building of the Bomer Indoor Theater that made it possible for Oregon Shakespeare Festival to expand from being a season of four or five weeks in the outdoor theater in the summer to running from the spring through the fall. And that made a huge difference for not only Ashland, but for the for all of Southern Oregon, because suddenly they went from maybe 50,000 tickets a year being sold up to three or 400,000 tickets a year being sold. Um, and and um, uh, let's see. So I, I want to just kind of wrap it up by saying that um, it's a it's a combination of the people and activities of Southern Oregon University and the people and activities of Oregon Shakespeare Festival, especially that have helped to create things like um, numerous theater companies that we have in the valley today, uh, both small and large, in addition to OSF, two symphony orchestras that that play in the valley today. Um, as well as helping the the bottom line of you know hundreds of local restaurants and other businesses. Um, so um, if you want to learn more about many different topics of Ashland history, art, and neighborhoods, this is where you can do so. So, oh, I'm sorry that I got a little carried away, but uh, thank you so much for being being here with me.